How many of you have watched the, the game show, Let's Make a Deal? Everybody seen that? Well, let's imagine that the Let's Make a Deal angel came down from heaven and said to you, I've got two doors. Behind the first door is happiness, except it only comes occasionally. It spikes occasionally. Uh, but in between those spikes, I, there's a lot of just life on the treadmill, un some unhappiness, perhaps discouragement, perhaps even uh, depression. B behind the second door, there's not a lot of you know, spikes of happiness, but there are times of happiness, occasion ti occasional times of happiness. But more than that, th there is an ongoing sense of satisfaction, sense of peace, sense of calmness, a sense of, of you know, uh, contentment that continues day after day, week after week. Now, which door do you choose? Door one or door two? Well, door one is the world's happiness. Happiness that's based upon what happens around us. Many people seek, for ha seek happiness by, through their jobs or through their spouses or through their, their money or through uh, a number of the children, uh, their fame, their fortune, their uh, prestige, and on and on and on and on and on. That's the world's. But it doesn't last because we all realize that most happiness, though it comes at times and in waves, it doesn't stick around. There's always that it's temporal. We know that. But God says there's something different. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 5. He's saying, listen, I want to take you down a path that's headed towards happiness. Now he's talking to a group of people who have been under the oppression not only of the Romans, but also of the Grecians or before the Romans. They, are, they have been oppressed. They are looking for someone who will come and deliver them and give them continuing happiness. When we went to Romania, one of the things I, a couple of things I learned about the Romanians, as many of you who've gone with us, uh, one thing, they're the most grateful, humble people you'll ever meet. They are extremely humble. But one of the things I noticed, too, about, about them, especially for the older, not so much the younger generation, but the older generation, and at that, when we first went, they had been 14 years removed from the tyranny of the reign of commun communism. And so one of the th things I noticed about these humble, grateful people, and they were so grateful for our, come, for our coming and teaching the Word and opening the Word of God, but one thing I noticed is that some of the older people had the look, you could tell they'd been under oppression for many, many years. That's what I think the Jews and the people in this day that Jesus wrote, I think they had that look of having been oppressed. And, and they were looking for happiness. And so Jesus says, I want to take you down a road, down a path. I want you to, to notice the road marks, the road signs. See, you know, we, each step of the way, he says, I've got a road sign that will continue to direct you down the path that will lead to lasting satisfaction, joy, which is God's happiness. It's not happiness based upon the circumstance, but based upon it's, in, it's an inside job. He says, I want to take you to Macarius. What's Macarius? That's a word for blessed. Macarius. It means blessed. It means contentment, peace, satisfaction. In fact, the people in that day really understood, and we understood this because when Jesus used the word makarios, their minds went directly to the island of Cyprus. Why? Because the island of Cyprus was the island that people referred to as makarii. That meant, again, the, the happy island they referred to it. It was, had everything you could want, fruits, vegetables, everything, the perfect climate, perfect beaches, nat all the natural resources, and they believed that you did not have to go beyond the coastline of uh, Macaria, the island of Cyprus, for anything. That, it, that happiness was contained in, on this island. That was their, what they believed. And so when Jesus says, blessed, their minds went, Psh! 
They connected the dots. They knew what he was talking about. He was saying, That's, oh, so you're saying this is what brings happiness. And Jesus begins to give us the road map to happiness. And again, it's an inside job. And, and these people, again, are looking, people who have been oppressed, they're looking for happiness. And so Jesus says, here's how you get there. Now let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And hold your place there. In just a moment, we're going to go somewhere else. But let's review just briefly here. The first week, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does it mean, poor in spirit? He's saying you are to recognize that your condition before God. The humble person, the person that's void of pride, is a person who recognizes who they are in light of God's holiness and God's righteousness. They understand now they've been saved. They understand they've been delivered. And they are eternally grateful for what God has done for them. They're like the person who, has been, who, who sees this oncoming car, and if they don't move quickly, they're going to be killed. And someone comes and... Pull them, pulls them away. And they, they were saved from sure death. And that person that's saved, that's rescued, what happens in that person's mind? They are forever grateful for what that person did for them, right? And what Jesus was saying, blessed are the poor in spirit who understand and who never get over the fact that Christ rescued us from this enormous debt of sin. And we never forget that. He essentially says there's no room for an ounce of seed of pride at all. And then the next thing, he, as we saw last week, he said, blessed are those who mourn. And what's he talking about? And we talked about different kinds of grief last week. There's proper grief, improper grief, but there's, there's godly grief. What is godly grief? Godly grief is grief over our sins. Now, we don't stay there in our sins, but we take our sins seriously. That was the point of, the, of, of what Jesus was saying in that second beatitude. It, it's like germs. W what do we do with germs? Dr. Stanley, what do you guys do with germs? You, you wash them away, right? You make sure when you go into an operating room, there are no germs there. And we do that especially during the winter, right? We wash our hands. Well, the point is, just like germs, we need to take our sins still seriously. We, we can't say, oh, that's not that big of a deal. Oh, it's okay here. In fact, I, I want us to go to, to Proverbs 6, 17 and 18. And Jerry, put up the, the basketball goal. This, I, I used this illustration last week, and some of you like this, this illustration. Uh, it's a great reminder. Uh, when the adjustable basketball goals came into existence, young people really liked those basketball goals that you could adjust. In other words, you could bring them down. Why? Well, the regulation, the official regulation uh, in terms of the height of a basketball goal is 10 feet. If it's more than 10 feet, in other words, a few inches, it's wrong. If it's less, it's wrong. Every gym, you walk into that basketball goal, you see those goals, they're 10 feet tall. Now, with the adjustable goals, you can lower them. Why? Because it's fun dunking those bas the ball through that. It's some, there's something addicting and empowering and, and uh, you know, whatever. And when you jump up and you go, right? Well, we, what's happened today, and, and, and my heart's been breaking over the last 10 years, so many Christians today, and not just unbelievers, I expect it out of unbelievers, but even Christians who now are lowering the standard of God's, God's standard, and saying, it's okay with, it's okay, that's not that bad. Besides, look at that person over there. And look at that person over there. And so I want to walk through just this passage. And, 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 and again, we're not in here to beat you over the head with seven sins. But I want to sh walk you through this passage to show you something. I want to show you that there are no small sins. Uh, Proverbs 6.16. Six sins doth God hate, yea, seven that are an abomination to him. You heard this before? Now, all sin 
are equal. All sins are equal. Okay? But for some reason, God designates these in his top seven list. Now, I want you to look, what I want you to see, that these are not the ones that we often think as the biggies today. Don't smoke, don't chew, go out with girls who do, that, that kind of stuff. That, that, these are not those, okay? But look who, what they say, what they say. In verse 17, haughty eyes, pride. That's exactly what Jesus is zeroing in on the first two Beatitudes. Pride. There is absolutely no room for pride as a believer. Look at the next one. A lying tongue. Hmm. Folks, there are, there's no such thing as small white lies. All lies are wrong. I grew up in a family, my dad, it, it, lying was next to murder. We got killed for lying. Uh, the third one, hands that shed innocent blood. Now that's murder, and that's a big one in our society today. So there's one of the th first three we've read, only one that's considered a biggie in a lot of our thinking, right? How about the next one? The heart that devises wicked plans. Hmm. Wow. Feet that run rapidly to evil. Hmm. A false witness who utters lies, slander, gossip. How about that one? That's lying again. And one who spreads strife among the brethren, brothers. I simply point this out, the point, to, the, 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 to accentuate perhaps what our Lord is saying. There are no small sins. And while we are under grace, remember what Paul said, there are, there's therefore no condemnation. And the Greek is emphatic. There is absolutely no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We understand that. But that doesn't mean that somehow we gloss over our sins and say, well, that, uh, that's just a small lie. That's a small, I, mean, I just cheated a little bit. Uh, I just lusted a little bit. I just coveted somebody else's spouse just a little bit. On and on and on and on. No. Jesus was saying we've got to take these seriously. Now, we are set free as we confess them, certainly, but we do not take anything lightly. See, the point is when the flesh pops up, uh, pops up, and we see these things come out, we say, oh, I, 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 in my own life, personal journey, one of the things I, I, I feel like God has kind of done to, with me over the years is that when I get to a certain period in time, God kind of pulls back the curtain of my soul and he says, you really think you're hot stuff? Yeah, take a look at this. And I see that stuff on the crud in my soul and I go, ooh, close the curtain. That's kind of what God does with us. And, and here's a point I want to make too. I didn't make this point last week. One of the reasons this is so important is not for us to live in despair. Remember, we're set free by the confession. But one of the reasons I think this is so important is that so many believers live the life on the treadmill, the spiritual treadmill, much like the Jews who live, try to live the life under the law, because there's no power. And that power has been bleached from their soul, has been eclipsed from their soul, that the whole power of the Holy Spirit, because of these small sins that continue to eat the vine. That's vitally important for us to know. The, the, someone has said that an alcoholic who won't admit that he's an alcoholic hates all other alcoholics. In, in the same manner, it's generally true that the sinner who won't face up to his sin will also hate other sinners. Why? Because they don't want to be reminded of their sin, and this, therefore they begin to judge others. They compare themselves with others and say, look, and they put down that person so they can have spirit, what I call spirituality by relativity. But the person... Who, under, who, who, who is poor in spirit, the one who mourns over their sin, is a person who is so thankful, and listen to this, they're so thankful to get any mercy whatsoever. And because of that, they're able to, in turn to give mercy to others. 
You follow me? And so one is not ready. And, and, and so this is why it's so important to understand. And by the way, if you didn't hear the other two messages, I encourage you to go online, uh, mountainviewmarietta.com, and listen to those messages because each message, each beatitude, is foundational to the next one. Poor in spirit is f- number one. M- mourning over our sins is number two. Now we come to number three. But listen, you can't become meek. There's no way to, be- to become meek if you don't walk through the first two. So it's important that you get this. And, and, and again, when you do this, your relationships, not only will you find joy and happiness in God's, from God's vantage point, but your relationships will become healthier. I'm convinced of that. In fact, I believe that what Jesus was saying here is not only will you find joy, but your relationships will become healthy as I want them. So Jesus gives his disciples the next road stop, the next road sign, whatever you want to call it, uh, on this journey to happiness. And it is the road less traveled because there are not many people today that will follow this guideline. In fact, I don't even hear this preached, uh, the Sermon on the Mount preached about anymore. But let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Let's read verse 5. It says, Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, if we could translate, for they shall uh, inherit the earth. Now, to fully understand the impact of this statement, mind you, you've got to know the context of of meekness here, in this time, in this day. Uh, To say to a Greek, to say that the highest virtue, one of the highest virtues, is meekness. Would, ha- would be to have them look at you and say, you're off your rocker. You are out to lunch. Because in the mind of the Greek, strength and might was the most important. Remember one of their famous leaders? Alexander the Great. And, and then you had the Jews. And the, and the Jews, again, had been under this, this um, tyranny of, of the Romans as well as the Grecians before that. And, and, and in their mind, the Messiah was coming back in a different way, with might. Uh, in, in fact, there were four different groups of, of Jews, and they all had a different mindset about how the Messiah would come back. But remember, they've been under oppression. They're looking for happiness. They're looking for relief. They're looking for satisfaction. Let me just walk through the the different groups. First, the Pharisees. And you know who they were. They were the religious snobs of the day, the religious elite, elite of the day. And they believed that the Messiah would come back with great fanfare and with great supernatural power. And then you had the Sadducees who didn't believe in immortality. They didn't, of the soul, they didn't believe in any type of resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. It's bad, isn't it? <laughs> but they believe that the Messiah would come back with great political power. And then there were the Essenes, and the Essenes removed themselves physically and philosophically from everybody else. They just kind of went out on the hillside, had their own commune, kind of their own theological camp, and they just ignored the Romans. They just said, the Romans don't exist. And then the Zealots. By virtue of their name, you can tell what, the, what it means. They believed that the Messiah would come back as a great military leader. And so here's Jesus who's saying, some of you think the Messiah should come back as this great leader, military leader, as this political leader, as this dictator, and all these other things. But I want to tell you, that's not the way he's coming. In fact, I'm the Messiah, and listen, this Messiah is coming back as one who is meek. And humble. And they're saying to each other, What did he say? He, he said what I said. Don't he say? Yeah. yeah, he did. Yeah. And they say, He's not a Messiah. He's not a deliverer. He's a chicken. Hmm. And see, we're almost immune to, to the radicalness of this statement. We've read this, the Bible, for years. And so, but to say that meekness is the predominant virtue here was just blew them away. Uh, 
most of our Lord's hearers wanted to justify their ways, wanted to justify their plans. They wanted to serve themselves. And so for Jesus to make this bold proclamation would be commensurate. It would be like the NCAA saying, beginning this fall, beginning this fall, we're going to stop all these injuries, all these concussions. Beginning this fall, we're going to play flag football. There won't be any more tackling. Can you imagine that? UGA and others. And people said, no, man, we want the blood and guts. We like the hitting and so forth. And some others are saying, man, that's, that's not football at all. I don't want to watch that. <laughs> no, it's radical. Completely radical. You, 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 you got to understand the context here. What he's saying. Um, Jesus is saying, listen, happiness and your, your, your satisfaction that you so long to have is not going to come through a military deliverance. It's going to come through meekness. I, I gave this quote last week. Let me give it again. G.K. Chesterton said, once defined a paradox as truth standing on its head, calling for attention. That's exactly what the Beatitudes are. Truth standing on its head. But what it really was, was Jesus was giving them guidelines, a pathway by which they could live an upright life in an upside-down world. That was the point. You say, well, what is meekness? Well, the first thing, let me point out what it's not. Meekness is not someone who is by their temperament or by their nature docile, calm, meek, or gentle. He's not a Casper milk toast. I, over the years, I've heard people refer to other people. And I have a couple of people in mind, I can remember it. Well, they referred to these people as gentle, and they said, he's really a meek man. And, he's a, and, and, the, and the particular person I'm thinking of uh, it was a very great, good man. Loved the Lord. But by, he was by his very nature, that, that's, way, that's the way he was. That's just the way he was. There are many people who by their very nature are meek and gentle. But that's not what this is talking about here. Uh, the, the, NIV, the New American Standard translates this gentle. However, the King James, the New King James, and the NIV all translate it meekness. The word gentle that's often translated is a Greek word, epa, ikia. And it meant being fair, moderate, not insisting on the letter of the law. Meekness, the one that's used here, preos, means mild and soft, and it speaks more of a state of mind, a state of an attitude. In the classical Greek, you say, what's classical Greek? Before we had the Koine Greek, the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, and we have Alexander the Great to thank for much of that. But before the Koine Greek, we had the classical Greek. And so when we, want to, when we study a word and we can't get the definition of a word, if we, if we don't have enough references in the New Testament on, in terms of how it's used, we go back to the, old, to the classical Greek, and then we go back to the Septuagint. In the classical Greek, this word was used to speak of the taming of a wild animal, such as a wild stallion. It was used in the context of a cool breeze in contrast to a hurricane, or of, of, of a mild medicine. That's the idea. One scholar said, it is a word with a caress in it. Here's my definition. Not original necessarily with me. Meekness is simply power under control. Power under control. Dr. Bruce Naramore, well-known Christian psychologist, said, it is one who has the capacity to assert himself, but who chooses not to. It's one who has the courage, the guts, to assert himself, to, but he doesn't react in, in his power and his strength. Michael Jordan one time found his, um, the Chicago Bulls behind by 20 points. So what did he do? He kicked it up into high gear. And he just took over the ball game. He began to contest every shot. 
swipe at every pass, get every rebound. And of course, as he did, he was superior in talent than anyone else. He just basically took his, put his team on his back and led them to victory. He just kind of mowed over the mere humans who were trying to defend him. One week later, the same person who had the same power, the same skill, in another basketball game, missed every shot. Got the ball taken away from him many times. Had many turnovers. Why? Because he was playing in a benefit game against disabled students. You see, he had his power under control. That's meekness. That's what that meekness means. The Hoover Dam is an incredible sight if you've ever been there. Debbie and I came up upon that, the Hoover Dam when we were about, we were a very young couple, two, two o'clock in the morning, and we were just kind of blown away by it. It just reeks with strength and power. And that dam provides enough energy for not just California, but for Arizona and Nevada. It is concentrated power under control. If that water, however, was turned loose, or if the dam broke, that water would bring devastation to the people that the dam was there to help. That's the idea of, of meekness. Again, it has great implications for our relationships. Our Lord was say, saying, listen, don't miss this. This is about your heart. Jesus was saying, all this is about your heart. And when your heart is right, when, you, when it takes, goes through the steps, and following the steps, not only to the path or to happiness and satisfaction and peace and contentment, but he's saying, I want you to know that it's going to bring your relationships to where they need to be. As long as there is the lack of meekness, you'll keep bumping into yourself and bumping into others. And, you, and there will be collateral damage and you won't be happy. Basically is what Jesus is saying. Tom Wolfe wrote the book, The Right Stuff. Any of you have read that book? Uh, Tom did a study on, uh, on the space program where it began back in the 40s and all the way up to the Mercury program. And he noticed one thing, that there, there was a, an it factor that separated the, the test pilots, the, the, real, the ones who really had that it factor, from the others in terms of the space program. And basically it was three things. Courage, uh, calmness under pressure, and total self-control. And, and, and Tom Wolf didn't have a name for that, so he entitled that, that package of virtues as the right stuff. Meekness is the right stuff. It doesn't come from a mammoth ego. No, it comes from a person who never gets over the fact that they have been bought with a price, they have been set free from this enormous debt. Jesus has rescued them from deaths, not just physical death, but eternal death. And because of that, they respond in meekness. When, when, when we think that everything needs to evolve around us, our plans, our purposes, our desires, when we think that, our relationships will go south. There won't be contentment. There won't be joy. There won't be peace. Henry Drummond was right when he said that anger and ir uh, irritation at, at other people for not giving us straight A's is probably responsible for more pain than any other sin. Let me read that again. He said the anger and irritation at other people for not giving us straight A's is probably responsible for more pain than any other sin. So how do you handle the slings and the arrows of others? 
Jesus said that meekness is responsible, is, is, is my response, I should say, to who I am before God. When, when I, I live that way, and I see myself as God sees me, then I will respond to others in mercy and meekness and grace. But if I get on my high horse and I have these seeds of pride, then I'm going to forget what Christ has done for me. Yes, I confess my sins, and we don't live in that despair. There's therefore no condemnation. But boy, we take it seriously, the small sins of our lives. Because we know that that will bleach the power of God in my, our lives. And you see, it's out of that change attitude that the switch is, is flipped. And we begin to respond to others like God would have us. A.W. Tozer said, The meek man is not a human mouse afflicted with a sense of his own inferiority. Rather, he may be in his moral life as bold as a lion, lion and as strong as Samson. But he has stopped, and watch this, he has stopped being fooled about himself. He has accepted God's estimate of his own life. He knows that he is as weak and as helpless as God declares him to be. But paradoxically, he knows at the same time, now watch this, that he is in the sight of God of more importance than angels. In himself, nothing. In God, everything. What did we talk about last week? Remember the illustration? God loves us not because we're good, but he loves us because we're precious. And he loves us because we're, and the reason we're precious is because Christ died for us. And, bec and, and because Christ died for us, we are accepted by him unconditionally in Christ. Charles Spurgeon said, no man ever becomes truly meek in the Christian sense of the word, until he first knows himself and then begins to mourn and lament that he is so far short of what he, he ought to be. Now, what about the manifestation? What's that look like? Well, in the, in the Bible, we have several examples of that. First, you have Joseph. Remember Joseph? His brother sold him into slavery. And, and, of course, he, they first left him for dead. Then they said, that's not a good idea. Let, let's sell him. And they sold him into slavery. And, of course, you know, by the, God's providential hand, he became second in the court of Pharaoh. And finally, there was a famine in the land, and his brothers show up at, in Egypt wanting food. And they are now confronted with Joseph. They don't know it's Joseph. And, of course, before long, he begins to reveal to them who he is. And they begin to backpedal and begin to come up with excuses. And Joseph says, save your breath. Save your breath. Now Joseph could have said, oh, am I so glad to see you. What goes around comes around. Boy, have I got a treat for you. No. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. David is another good example of meekness. That's meekness, by the way. David, who was chased by Saul many times, right? And Saul one day decides to take a rest, to take a nap. He goes into a cave. You know the story. David is in the cave. He goes to sleep. All his soldiers are telling David, kill him. Kill him. And he says, no, I'm going to do that. But he cut off a piece of his garment. Basically to say, I just want you to know, I could have taken your life. And later he even repented of that. That was meekness. Jesus. Jesus, who ran the money changers out of the temple. Who confronted the Pharisees and the religious elite when they distorted the word of God. And yet Jesus never one time took up his own defense. He never one time used his supernatural power to defend himself. No. What's that look like today? Meekness today. Well, it may look like this. When someone in a group begins to pontificate about something, maybe a theological issue, maybe somebody at your work, and they're pontificating about something, and they're wrong. You know they're wrong, and you have enough under the counter that you could blow them away. But you choose not to do that. By the way, I heard Chuck Swindoll say one time, when confronting people, you always keep more under the counter than you put on the counter unless you have to. It's a great statement. 
But instead of taking everything under the counter and blowing that person away, what do you do? You bite your tongue or you walk away. Maybe they, they make a statement that's an indirect slap at you, a shot at you. What do you do? You let it go. You walk away. Maybe someone's spreading a rumor about you, talking about you. What do you do? You bite your tongue instead of sharing a piece of your mind that you can ill afford to lose, knowing that you've got more ammunition in your arsenal than that person has. You walk away. You walk away. See, meekness is seen when, when you're in, you're, the pressure is on. You're under the gun. Deadlines are coming due. You've got problems all around you. You have sharks, uh, 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 alli- excuse, excuse me, alligators up to your hip. And there's no way to drain the swamp. And you're frustrated. And you see, if, if meekness doesn't show up there, you probably don't have the meekness that Jesus is talking about. What's a reward? Well, look at the passage. Go back into verse 5. Blessed are those are the gentle, the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The, the word they, again, as it is in each one of these, is emphatic. He is saying they alone. But what does it mean, inherit the earth? The word means uh, to receive one's allotted portion, one's rightful inheritance. It's really a quote out of Psalm 37. The meek will inherit the earth. What does it mean? We don't, no one knows for sure what it means. But let me tell you what I think it really means in a practical sense. It, mean, it doesn't mean that we are to conquer or take control of our worlds, of our situations. No, no. It means that, spiritually speaking, God will take care of our needs. God will fight the battle for us. Just as David said to Goliath. Remember that story? When Goliath hovered over him, and David said, this battle's not mine, this battle is God's, and God will fight the battle for, for me. I think that's what it means. You will inherit all that is rightfully yours. God will fight for the territories of your life. Leave it to God. I, I heard once about this, this uh, uh, baby that was born, and, uh, right, and, and the doctor takes the baby from the mother womb's womb, and he holds the baby up, and then upside down, he begins a kind of spanking on its behind. And the caption of the cartoon, instead of the baby crying, it shows the baby becoming angry and say, "I want a lawyer." You know, a lot of us want that. We we, we think it's a lot easier to sue somebody's pants off than wait on God to to fight the battle for us. And that's the point here. One who's meek doesn't have to fight the battle because God will take it up for him or her. <sighs> Obviously, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you can't fight that battle. You don't have the power resident in you to fight that battle. If you've never come to know Christ as your personal Savior, I'm talking about as your Savior You've got to trust him. But, but the next step after trusting him is saying, okay, Lord, my life is yours. I don't have the right to take up arms for myself. No. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a great Bible teacher who followed the, the, uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon in the pulpit in England. And Martin Lloyd-Jones has been quoted by just about every scholar on this very issue that I read. He said that meekness comes from having a right view of yourself before God. You don't worry about what others say about you because you know that you deserve it and more. <laughs> instead, of you, instead, you are amazed that God treats you so well and that men are as kind to you as they are. In your heart, you know you deserve worse than you're getting. He went on to say, the meek man does not fight for his own rights, does not insist upon personal vindication, does not always have to correct others, does not repay in kind, does not return insult for insult, and does not use force and intimidation to get his way. That's meekness. And God calls us 
to meekness. To be that sweet, swelling, smelling aroma of meekness in the eyes of men and in the eyes of the world. Let's pray.